thank you everybody who uh, is able to attend and, and listen um, and those folks who are maybe watching it later via the, the YouTube channel. Um, but I'm going to give an overview of my research here at the University of Richmond and try to put it in a much larger context. Uh, so I've only been at Richmond for a couple of years, but we're starting some interesting projects to try to dovetail this with other cities that we've worked in to try to figure out some of these questions about rats as community members. So the goals for today's talk are uh, not overly complicated. I will show a fair bit of data later on, but my main goal is to introduce rats as a member of an urban ecological community. They may not be a welcome member of the urban ecological community, but they're here to stay. Um, and so we'll talk about that and also their checkered history with our own species and why we may not welcome them here. And then I'm going to briefly overview a few projects ongoing in my lab, both uh, internationally, other cities within the US, and then focus on the work we're doing here in Richmond, Virginia at the very end. And then uh, throughout, I'm trying to connect rats to our own, what I call the human enterprise, uh, where we're trying to make our living in dense aggregations of human settlement, and so are they. And there are some overlaps with the goals between the two species. When I ask audiences in person, it's a little different via Zoom, uh, to look at these pictures and identify which one is, quote, good habitat. Almost everyone will point to the upper right photo there where you have some mountain stream and a rainforest somewhere. Uh, we think about high biodiversity levels. And when I show a picture of a city, here we have Roanoke, Virginia, um, people tend to think that that's going to be devoid of life, or at least devoid of the species that, that we may be interested in from an ecological perspective. Uh, when we talk about urban systems, generally, even biologists for a long time neglected them because they just assumed they weren't very interesting biologically. Uh, but if we juxtapose that with something like a desert, we can argue in many cases that urban ecosystems are more biodiverse and maybe even have more biomass in com some contexts than some of these quote unquote natural intact ecosystems. So we're going to dovetail that a little bit with our discussion of rats today. And when we think about urban wildlife specifically, people have a huge range of tolerances to urban wildlife, depending on what species we're talking about. And that goes for species that have huge followings and adoration, like peregrine falcons that are increasing population sizes in cities much faster than in non-urban areas, which would have been um, initially their native habitat. But here is a picture from our Richmond Falcon Cam from one of the falcons that nests on the building next to the Federal Reserve in downtown Richmond. So obviously a lot of effort is dedicated to propagating that in the public's attention as a success story. And then we look at another bird that is generally universally disliked, or at least people are um, agnostic about it. And so we put these spikes up to prevent pigeons from taking up habitat on these buildings that we have put up. And then there are species kind of in between, like coyotes and like deer, where people are interested in them. Maybe they're quasi tolerant of them, but in some contexts, we don't welcome them and we try to remove them from environments where people have settled and, and developed those landscapes. So that article in the lower right, if you're interested, is from this week's uh, New Yorker. So it talks about efforts to control deer populations in Staten Island as part of New York City. And then there is a special place in public relations hell for rats. And so rats are pretty much universally despised, um, at least outside of the context of maybe the pet trade. Uh, but these are all signs indicating all the bad things that, that people associate with rats, rightfully so. Now there are a couple notable exceptions to this. So 2007 movie Ratatouille by Disney and Pixar. Remy is the rat that gains people's affection through his ability to cook. And then Pizza Rat, which was a YouTube sensation starting in 2015, has over 11 million views and got a lot of attention for doing the simplest things for both people and humans. He was just trying to secure a little bit of pizza. Now, when we talk about rats, what species are we talking about? Because there are quite a number of rat species, but when we talk about urban rats and the problems that we have with urban rats, we're generally talking about two species, Rattus ratus, which is the roof rat, and Rattus norvegicus, which is the Norway rat. And I'm also throwing the house mouse, Mus musculus up there, which is also a denizen in dense urban settlements as well, but pretty distantly related by about 15 million years from the Rattus genus. And within Rattus, uh, the species that are now Rattus norvegicus and Rattus ratus split maybe two to three million years ago, 
And then for reasons we don't know, a subset of the Rattus genus, which includes Rattus rattus, but not Rattus norvegicus, went through a huge speciation event where it went from one species to maybe 10 to 12 species in a matter of half a million years. So fairly rapid uh, evolutionary divergence there. That's the context. So those are the two species we're going to be talking about. For the most part, in our latitudes where it gets pretty cold in the winter, it's mostly the Norway rat, which is relevant. You may have a roof rat occasionally come into the city, but they don't tend to last long because they're competitively inferior to the Norway rat. Uh, roof rats we tend to see more in tropical and subtropical zones. Okay, so no surprise, humans don't like rats, and we've waged a long time war on rats. And here are just a few excerpts from uh, media uh, that has highlighted our war on rats. And so I can't imagine a, a less flattering picture of rats than that upper left hand side from The Guardian. And then here we have an um, article from The New Yorker in 1968. So going back, you know, 60 years at this point, the war on rats going on at that point. And then like clockwork, every time a new administration comes into a big city like New York, they declare war on rats and they throw a lot of money at the problem. So in 2017, uh, Bill de Blasio in New York said he was dedicating $37 million to fight uh, rats in New York and, and rid the city of them uh, to minimal effort if or to minimal effect, if any at all, as rat populations are increasing. But this war is not new over the last several decades. We know that we've had issues with rats for a very long time. For example, here is a piece of art from medieval period. So here is probably most likely roof rats uh, identified as the cause of bubonic plague, which is caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis in many parts of the world, but Europe gets the most attention because that's where most of the history was written at that time. We now know it was uh, transferred as a vector or vectored through uh, flea bites. So on fleas or on fleas on rats and then transferred to humans when they move hosts to take another blood meal. Um, there's also some interesting history related to colonization and how that may have led to the spread of rats and practices to quote unquote wage war against them. So there's something called the Great um, Hanoi Rat Massacre of 1902. It was sort of lost to, to history until this historian went over there in the 1990s and dug up a lot of paperwork on this incident. But this uh, is Hanoi, Vietnam now, but at that point it was um, the capital of French Indochina when it was a colony of France. And so the French governor at uh, one point decided to invest a lot of money to turn a section of Hanoi into quote unquote, a, a Western developed sort of part of town. And as part of that, uh, he put in sewers, nice uh, multi-story buildings. Uh, but one problem with that is when they connected those sewers to the rest of the city in the affluent there, it was like uh, introducing a corridor for the rats to make it from the low socioeconomic areas to this relatively new and modern high socioeconomic area. And so the rats would come in and they'd come up the toilets. And it was a big problem that obviously didn't meet the standards that that government was expecting there. And so they put a bounty on the heads of rats and hired um, uh, local people to try to trap them and they would get money for every individual that they trapped. Uh, but that wasn't enough. So then they opened it to the general public who um, they didn't bring rat carcasses at that point. They just had to bring the rat tail and they would get a certain amount of money for every tail that was brought um, to the government official. And that was a source of income. But being industrious as, as any society is, there were reports of lots of rats running around the city with no tails. So they would take the tails, leave the rats to continue reproducing. Um, and also stories of rat farms that were developed right outside of the city to actually breed and propagate these things so they could get the tails, take it into the city and get the bounty on these rats. So maybe a lesson on government incentives meet industrious um, ways of making money for local residents. Anyway, a little bit about the history there. In Richmond specifically, we've certainly had our own long war on rats. And so many thanks to Matt DeWalt at the University of Richmond Communications Office for digging up some of these historical articles. And most of them come from about the 1939 to 1946 era. So right around World War II, there were apparently very high populations of rats around Richmond. And so in several iterations, the mayor uh, declared war on the rats and put a lot of money and effort towards trying to put out poisons and trap them and, and things like that. Uh, so these are articles from 1939, 1940. Here you can see Mayor Ambler launches war on rats 
1941. And then when the new mayor came in, uh, he appointed a new director of the Department of Health for the city in 1944 that made it a mission to, again, declare war on rats in the city. And so here's a pretty uh, interesting picture. This is taken by the Magnolia Street um, landfill, which is no longer there. Uh, but that was a intense resource pool for these rats. And so they did a ton of trapping over there. And you think about the personal protective equipment that was required then, I don't think OSHA was a thing. So that individual would look very different today doing that same job. Okay, but importantly, rats do have real impacts that we need to focus on and, and think about why we need to at least limit their population size, even if we don't have any real hope to completely eradicate them. And one is that they are a main reservoir for zoonotic diseases. And so recently there was a term um, that was coined called disease sponges, where they're so in contact with lots of different parts of their environment that they have a potential to come in contact with a lot of pathogens and parasites that can infect them and in turn potentially infect us when we come in contact with them or they come in contact with our food. And so it's a pretty evocative term. If you're looking for a new insult for uh, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, you have some political conversations, disease sponges, I recommend maybe one to try out. Uh, but in, in addition to zoonotic diseases, they're also a main source for food contamination, both here in the US where it's estimated they do about $1.6 billion annually of damage to agricultural crops and foodstuffs, but we can magnitude that or increase that by orders of magnitude if we think about how they affect food resources globally. One we think of less often is the damage they cause to urban infrastructure because they do chew, they do gnaw. Um, and so when they are burrowing, they're also excavating a lot of soil material. And um, so in this example, I have a picture that we took of a park in lower Manhattan. And so this is a park where the rat infestation was so extensive, the burrows were so deep under there, there were so many rats digging and removing that soil material that it wasn't enough to support the weight of the pavers and the benches and the playgrounds on top of the surface. And so the whole surface just collapsed by about two to three feet, making the park unusable and costing the city hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to repair, even after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to um, eradicate the rats from that particular area. So we don't usually think about the damage to infrastructure, but it is very important and city planners are thinking about that more and more. The last one we also almost never talk about, and that's the consequences for mental health, where when people are constantly surrounded by rats um, and the negative connotations that come with rats and the very real risks that come with rats, it can take a toll on someone's mental health and sense of well-being. And so there was a paper recently published in 2019 and the main subtitle was called, They're Always There, and was inter based on interviews and um, qualitative scientific methods to assess how people feel in areas where they are and are not constantly exposed to rats running around their environment. But for me, as an urban ecologist, I think we also need to think about it as just a new niche, a novel and interesting niche that this species has been able to do quite well in as humans start to aggregate in cities more and more. And so here I have a diagram from a study in 2002, which first coined the term urban exploiter. And rats are an ur urban exploiter, but they're not the only one. So these are species on the right side of this x-axis where they tend to proliferate near the urban core, where there's a ton of impervious surface like pavements, like concretes, and they do really, really well living around people. And by doing well, I mean their populations can get very big and they can utilize those new resources, okay? And as we move away from the city toward, towards the, the rural exurban areas, we tend to get higher species richness, sure, but it's a very different subset of species, generally species that can't also survive in these new urban environments. The other term you may have heard of is commensal. So uh, rats are commensal, which literally means at the table uh, with us. And the new sort of jargony term is anthro-dependent, which I think is pretty telling. So they're dependent on humans for their ability to succeed. And so in this image, you know, all these species that we see in cities, if we highlight them, they really excel in cities because of their ability to utilize our resources and live alongside us and live uh, taking advantage of whatever parts of our resource pool that we don't fully utilize. So you can see pigeons there, mice, you can see the rat at the bottom. You can also see mosquitoes and lice and fleas. And in those buildings, we have cockroaches and bedbugs 
Those are species that may exist in a quote natural context, but they certainly don't exist as highly successful species that are at huge population sizes like we see in the city. And I love this image here because that commensal lifestyle by definition means that there's a ton of human interaction between these rats and us. And so it means that when we put trash out on the sidewalk overnight, waiting for the um, trash truck to come pick it up the next day, this nocturnal animal will be able to take full advantage of it. And that's one area that we may come in contact with them or their excrement and these things that could potentially transmit zoonotic diseases. So for an urban ecologist, if you think about what we're usually thinking about, we're thinking about the green spaces in cities. That, that would get, that's what gets the vast majority of the attention. And so here we have an aerial image of the northern part of the island of Manhattan. We have Bronx and across the George Washington Bridge there, we see Fort Lee, New Jersey. And usually urban ecologists are focusing on all these green patches, the northern tip of Central Park there. Let's see if my cursor works here. We have High Bridge Park here, Fort Tryon, Inwood Park, Van Cortland Park, all these things we think about connectedness and these green spaces being super important as uh, urban wildlife habitat. And that's absolutely true. But if we think about commensals, something like the rat or the pigeon, we have to invert how we think about this. And so we're looking at landscapes that are predominantly impervious surfaces. Where does the trash congregate? Where do the people congregate? And so we have to invert how we think about what is good habitat and what is bad habitat. Now we'll get to Richmond uh, eventually, but you can certainly tell that the difference between the aerial image of New York City or parts of New York City and Richmond, there are some similarities and there are some differences. The urban core is certainly less expansive, but it fundamentally looks the same. And if this were an image with leaves on the trees, you would see quite a bit more canopy cover in Richmond overall than you see in New York City, even accounting for large parks like Van Cortland or Central Park. What I'm going to do first is give a brief overview of some of the projects in my lab so that we have context. And I'll start with our project in Salvador, Brazil, because that's what first got me into rats. So my background, my PhD was actually on amphibian ecology and evolution. So my former life was spent traipsing around the pristine woods of New England, searching out vernal pools and sampling in these beautiful areas. And somehow it transitioned to urban field work where I'm going into dumpsters and around dumpsters looking for the species that we're interested in. But the thing that connects them is the genetic tool set. So I have the little art picture there by Jason Holly that um, looks at how we can use, or what I do is figure out how we can use genetic and genomic tools to piece together the ecology and the evolution of these organisms and what it means for their successes in their environment and maybe their limitations. And so that all started in Salvador, Brazil. So that's where I'll start. I'll next move into some data some projects that we have in New York City. Then I'll expand out to some global data sets that we're working on. And then I'll end up talking about two or three projects we have going on here in Richmond, maybe what many of you are most directly interested in. And I'll say, I'm gonna blow through this stuff pretty quick, just give a very superficial overview. Um, and if you guys are interested in, a lot of these projects have associated papers that I'd be happy to send to you or talk to you more afterwards or outside of this particular one hour timeframe we have. Okay, so the first project focuses on rats and a disease called leptospirosis in Salvador, Brazil. And uh, just to acknowledge, this is part of a much larger project that's run by epidemiologists that noticed increases, dramatic increases in the number of clinical leptospirosis cases in Salvador in the mid 1990s, and they increased. And so um, they started making this part of uh, emphasis of their research. And at some point they figured out, okay, Rats are the main vector here. We need to include ecologists and people that know rats or can figure things out about rats. And so that's how we came on board for this project. Now, leptospirosis, if we were in person, I'd ask everybody, how many of you have heard of leptospirosis? Uh, assuming it's not a public health audience, very few people in the United States have heard of leptospirosis, which is a good thing. It's mostly associated with pets, and we do have a vaccine for that we give pets here in the U.S. But globally, it's a very important emerging infectious disease. Historically, it was mostly in rural areas, but with increasing urban settlement patterns where more and more of the population is in cities, it's increasing here much quicker than it is in rural areas. It's considered a neglected disease because the people that are most likely to acquire leptospirosis are the ones that are most likely to have the least resources to combat it. It is treatable with an early course of antibiotics, but the populations we're talking about oftentimes do not have access 
to a doctor, let alone antibiotics. There's more than a million cases that are documented globally with about 60,000 deaths. So that's about a five to 6% death rate. So it is a major public health concern, even if we don't hear much about it in the United States. It's caused by a spirochete bacteria that's closely related to Lyme disease and syphilis. It has seasonal outbreaks during the wet season because of the way the bacteria itself can survive in stagnant bodies of water and moist soil. So here's a plot looking at monthly rainfall in those blue lines. Uh, in those red bars on this plot are a number of human cases annually. And you can see there's a pretty, pretty close correspondence. Here's a map of where leptospirosis infects the most people annually. And you don't need statistics to figure out that that is a pattern that's highly associated with tropical and subtropical zones. And also in countries with low socioeconomic means, what we would generally consider the global south at this point. Even though it's not common in the United States and uh, the global north, it certainly can be an issue that crops up with outbreaks. And so I'm getting a lot of questions recently from media outlets because New York City is experiencing a pretty substantial outbreak relative to what you see on a year to year basis. So at this point, there are actually 16 cases of individuals being hospitalized and one death uh, throughout, um, I think, two different boroughs within New York City. And as you might expect, it's uh, disproportionately affecting homeless populations and individuals that come in close contact with rats as part of their job, maybe pest management professionals or people in public housing complexes that, that work in areas of the building that have rat infestations. And importantly for us in the rat and how the rat fits into this is that it's a, a zoonotic disease with mammalian hosts and the relevant serotype, which means strain essentially, is carried uh, generally by the Norway rat. And if we look at Salvador, Brazil specifically, when we've assessed this, about 80% of rats in Salvador carry leptospires. So if you're thinking about a public health campaign designed to reduce people's risks, that's a pretty uphill battle if 80% of the potential vectors in their environment do indeed carry this potential zoonotic pathogen. Now, important, the leptospires tend to concentrate in the kidney of not only rats, but any mammalian host. But for rats, um, they excrete high amounts of this bacteria through their urine. And during the rainy season, when these wet, stagnant environmental reservoirs are around, like these pools of water, those bacteria can remain viable and infectious for months. And so understanding the rat, as well as these environmental reservoirs is an important part of the epidemiology of this disease. Okay, so why is leptospirosis emerging now? And why is Salvador the place to study it? Most people in the US probably don't know where Salvador is. It's actually the third biggest city behind Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, and it's on the extreme East Atlantic coast over here. Um, and it was the formal colonial capital actually of Salvador. So one reason it's emerging now is because of the change in how we distribute ourselves across the world. And so human urban populations are growing around the year 2010. That's the inflection point where more than half of humans were estimated to live in cities and urban aggregations. And that proportion is increasing over time. If we focus on Salvador specifically, Salvador has grown in human population size by 500% in 60 years. So just imagine trying to take Richmond's population today, multiply it by six and jam that same number of humans into the same municipal boundaries it's extreme population growth by almost any definition. And the way this population growth happens isn't the way it's happening in Richmond, where by and large you have suburban sprawl and new developments cropping up in the exurban areas like we might see around here, but it's very much people being relegated to these slum habitats. And in Brazil, you call them favelas, that's the Portuguese term for slums. But these are areas where you have high aggregations of people, very little sanitation, and so it means that people are coming into close contact with the environmental reservoirs where the leptospirosis and leptospire bacteria would be. It also means that they have very limited access to healthcare to deal with these infections when it does become a, a clinical infection that requires attention. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about one of the projects that we've done in Salvador today because I think it's the most interesting and probably the most relevant for other cities as well. But Cities around the world, pretty much every city has some effort to eradicate rats or at least lethally control their numbers with varying success. 
Usually it's a matter of putting rodenticide poison down. There are some new techniques like applying dry ice and maybe even rat birth control, but those are very new and haven't been used very long. So uh, to be determined how well those work. But anytime uh, cities implement one of these eradication campaigns, um, it generally works on a short scale, but rat numbers really quickly rebound to pre-eradication numbers. We call it the boomerang effect. So on average, we've seen anywhere from six to 18 months, that population will go from whatever numbers are after eradication back to pre-eradication numbers. So less than a year and all the money and effort that was spent, it was for naught. So what we did is took advantage of a 2015 coordinated eradication campaign in Salvador, in particular in one of these neighborhoods, Pau de Lima, that had heavy rat infestation and heavy burdens of leptospirosis. And we wanted to know how did these uh, lethal intervention campaigns affect the genetics of urban rats. And I'll walk through a couple of hypotheses we had about this after um, this slide right here, uh, where I mentioned that um, what we did is collect samples right before the eradication started. And then I collected samples one month after the eradication was completed, and then seven months post eradication to see if we could pick up on any rebound. So out of this, we got 241 rats total. Uh, the map you see in the lower right is the geography we're talking about, the area of Salvador that's probably been most extensively studied in terms of rats and leptospirosis risk. And then what we did is analyze the population genetics over time across these three different valleys that are part of this particular landscape and at those three time points. And so the first hypothesis we wanted to test is kind of just a basic evolutionary hypothesis. So we wanted to look at not how the actual population size with number of rats changes, we were tracking that in other ways, but we wanted to know about the genetic population size. So the fancy term is effective population size, um, which uh, gives us a picture on the genetic diversity that's present in that population. Um, and we wanted to know, will that number decline at the same rate that the actual number of rats declines? Um, so essentially this is a measure of genetic bottleneck in the lower right here, you see this is a population that maybe has a ton of genetic diversity represented by the different colored balls here. It goes through some bottleneck, so the population becomes much smaller, much quicker. And then the individuals that survive and reproduce on the back end of that catastrophic lethal event are a subset. And maybe we lose some alleles and some genetic diversity during this bottleneck. But nobody's ever done this in rats. So that's what we set out to do. And sure enough, the short version of this is that, yes, there was a huge genetic bottleneck. So the rat population decreased by about 30 to 50 percent is our estimate based on tracking numbers. Uh, but the genetic population size decreased by up to three quarters. So that means they're losing 75 percent of the, their genetic variation between the pre-eradication periods in these three valleys and the post-eradication periods during these three valleys, indicated by the red and gold bars here. So a huge loss of genetic variation. The hypothesis, the second hypothesis we want to address is, does this drop in population size lead to um, things like inbreeding, which we know why that's a huge risk. It's the reason that purebred dogs have so many issues like German shepherds and hip dysplasia and things like that. So the idea is that the eradication or the lethal control will hit some rat colonies harder than others, leaving fewer colonies to repopulate. And so it means that you may have a higher degree of relatedness among individuals that are surviving. So this is a measure of inbreeding. And the short answer here is that, yes, relatedness increased significantly in two of those three valleys. So on the y-axis of these two plots, this is valley two and valley four, relatedness index goes from low to fairly high. Interestingly, it drops back down for the seven month later sample. We think that's a matter of sample size because each of these points is one rat that was sampled or one rat pair. Over here in valley four, over time you have uh, an increase in relatedness over time after the eradication. So yes, more inbreeding. Hypothesis three was related to population genetic structure. So we can characterize the genetics of a population by looking at all the loci across its genome and saying how similar or different they are from rats collected over here and rats collected over here. And so it may be the case that rats that are not taken out lethally during this campaign are the ones that are left and may be a a non-random subset of whatever gene pool was there initially. 
Don't worry about the method we use, discriminant analysis, principal components. It's a fairly complicated statistical analysis to, to draw in thousands of loci potentially into this measure. And so this is a measure of population genetic structure. So the short answer is yes, there was a huge and consistent shift in population genetic structure. And just to walk you through these a little bit, the x-axis here is that discriminant function. So combining all those genetic loci, what it matters literally doesn't matter as much as the fact that if you are on different points, if you are a curve on a different point of this x-axis, you are quite a bit different than someone on a different part of this x-axis. So these are all the rats from Valley 1, and they are very different from all the rats in Valley 1 post-eradication, so pre-eradication, post-eradication. Same in Valley 2, a huge shift. Same in Valley 4, a huge shift. Okay, so big change in genetic signatures within these populations. Okay, so what does it mean? Uh, these are pretty important implications for public health because we know that these eradication campaigns, while possibly successful in the short term, never work in the long term. Um, and there is clear and pretty quick impacts that we see on the population genetics of these populations. So it could mean two things evolutionarily. It's not a good thing for the population you're focusing on if you remove a large proportion of its genetic variation. Those are um, alleles that are lost and you can't use to respond to future changes in your environment. But on the other hand, in addition to what may be a challenge evolutionarily, it may be that the rats that are surviving these lethal control campaigns are really well adapted and there's a reason they're surviving and not being taken out during these eradication campaigns. So there's this idea of super rats. Are we actually putting them through a bottleneck that leads to, on the back end of these bottlenecks, highly adapted, really successful urban rats that are going to proliferate, proliferate like crazy because they're the ones that are left? What it does mean is that these long-term genetic viability impacts to the population need to be factored in by cities and integrated pest management plans when we try to figure out how we're going to address the problem of urban rats and reduce their numbers. Okay, so that's the situation for Salvador. And that's really interesting. Some of the first data on urban rat ecology, and especially definitely the first data on urban evolutionary genetics for these things. So Salvador is a pretty well worked out system. There are a few other studies that I didn't have time to cover today, but we feel like we have a pretty good handle on what's going on in Salvador. But that's one city in one place. And we really need to expand these insights to other cities. And so I started working with um, some urban ecologists at Fordham University there in New York City to try to expand our understanding to rats in New York City and then from other cities as well, as we'll walk through. So the main emphasis or the main project that I'll talk about related to New York City rats has to do with habitat suitability models. Now, there are other projects going on there, some genetic, some ecological, but I think habitat suitability models is probably the project I'm most excited in because it's going to give us the most general insights about rats, not just in Salvador, not just in New York City, but also in other cities where there's not nerdy rat biologists running around trying to collect this data. And so what a habitat suitability model is, is an estimate or an attempt to estimate or model how supportive environments are for a particular species. Now, habitat suitability models are generally applied to species in environments that are, quote, unquote, pristine, or for species that may be uh, endangered by changing climates, we want to predict what habitats will be supportive for them as the climate warms or pre precipitation regimes change. But here we're going to apply it in an urban context. And so I'm just going to give some very basic background on, on what a habitat suitability model is and what it requires. The first thing you need is occurrence data. So in our case, where do we find the rats? So that just, when you map it, just looks like a series of points. Where do they show up on the landscape? And then we combine that with environmental data. So what other variables like temperature, like precipitation, like land cover, what areas or what types of environmental variables overlap in those areas where we find the organism itself? And this is all done in GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And then we apply this in other uh, model-based software to try to statistically tie these things together. And so when we look for the statistical degree of overlap, that's what gives us something like a suitability map that we see here in the lower right, where we can go anywhere from high suitability habitats to low suitability habitats. And it probably is pretty intuitive why that may be so valuable for planning purposes when we're trying to make a habitat less suitable in, in the case of rats specifically. 
Okay, so for rats, what does the current state look like? So in New York City, we're using citywide rat inspection data. In some other cities, we have to draw from 311 public complaint data where people call in and, or they use an app to report a rat sighting. So each of these points is where people have reported. And actually in this case, it's where city inspectors have actually gone and confirmed that there were active rat signs. So that's our occurrence data. Now we need to combine that with environmental data in for Manhattan. Specifically, this looks something like on the far left, we have median household income, a metric of socioeconomics. We have land cover where redder colors are more impervious surfaces, greener colors are uh, uh, grass, um, permeable surfaces, tree canopy, things like that. Over here, we have a digital elevation map. Uh, anybody that's seen Washington Heights recently, you can see why it's called Washington Heights. We're up here where it's much higher elevation than most of the rest of Manhattan. And then over here, we have a map of food service establishments. So if we think that availability of food and human food waste specifically is a driver for rats, we certainly wanna be able to map that and see how it correlates with where we find the rats. So the next thing we need to do is to create these probability distributions, these statistical models to understand the occurrence of the rats or the likelihood of occurrence of these rats in each pixel of these maps. And I put this picture down here because sometimes it could be comical. At one point we had five or six computers all lined up trying to truck through this data because it's pretty computer intensive. But what we saw when we looked for New York City specifically, at least in the preliminary analyses, there is some fine tuning going on, but I don't think the general picture will shift. But the general picture that we have at this point is that the most dominant predictor of where the rats will be is median household income. Okay, so stop me if you've heard this before, but socioeconomics and social justice and environmental justice issues are relevant for rats the same way they are relevant for lots of other things that we talk about in urban systems, some of which we'll come back to in a few slides. And you can see the other factors that were um, important in predicting, or it's called contribution to occurrence, but predicting where the rats were in New York City. Human population density was the second most predictive variable, land cover, density of restaurants, which actually surprised us that it was fourth on the list and not number one or two. Okay, we'll come back to this table in a little bit. But when we convert this to a visual map, which is what most people are probably interested in, this is what it looks like. You can see a map of all of Manhattan where we have suitability as an index between the numbers zero and one, okay? And you can see that the probability of those rats being located across the island of Manhattan is pretty heterogeneous. Different likelihoods of seeing rats in different areas of the city. And when you go out and you try to trap for these things or you go just walking around with an eye looking for rats, yeah, this makes sense. Where we see those reds and those oranges are where it's very easy to come in contact with the rat. In other areas, it's more difficult. Now I want to point out this area of Midtown right about there. So you see that area of very low suitability. That's Midtown Manhattan. If anybody's been to Manhattan uh, as a tourist, you've almost certainly started there. That's where you're going to find your Madison Square Garden, your Empire State Building, your Rockefeller Center, Times Square. And notably, it's an area of low suitability, which kind of confuses us. A lot of people there. But it turns out the city's very good about picking up trash multiple times a day in an area where tourists are visiting and spending lots of money. And it's not a project I'm going to focus on here for this talk, but I just want to point out we did similar population genetic analyses for the rats of New York City and where we look for a divide between rats that are more or less similar genetically broke down right about there at Midtown. So the symbols here, the more large and dark you are, are as a symbol means that you are quite different from a large and lighter color block down here. So this means that this cluster of rats in lower Manhattan is very different genetically than this cluster of rats in upper Manhattan. And that corresponds with that area of low suitability. Now there's certainly more work we need to do to make sure that we have a handle on that, but that's the pattern we see at this point. And I'll tell you what, if you wanna get some attention from the New York media or uh, national media, you just need to do a project on rats in New York City because this got a ton of press attention, oftentimes highlighting the uptown downtown connection. And I think NPR in this article up here, this radio segment played that Billy Joel song. So very creative, certainly gets lots of attention. So our next steps are to take this same 
framework of trying to map urban habitat suitability for rats and extend it to many cities, not just in the US, not just in North America, but globally. And so, so far we've been able to do that for also Washington DC, Chicago, New Orleans, and Vancouver. And currently my lab is working on data from Boston, Vienna, Amsterdam, Paris, Helsinki, and hopefully Richmond as well. We'll be able to add this to the global data set. Um, and so again, the goal here is to come up with some general understanding of what makes good or bad urban rat habitat so that cities that don't have the attention from researchers and scientists trying to figure this out can have some general insights that they can apply in trying to mitigate rat issues in their own city. The last thing I'm gonna highlight from New York specifically is this uh, project we did as part of trying to understand how COVID lockdowns for people might have affected the rats. And I won't go into detail now, you can look up the study if you're interested, but this is a map I created where I literally just stitched together um, the, the concentrations of rat sightings across the city of New York between the years of 2014 and June of 2020, so at the end of lockdown. And uh, the only thing I'll say here is that rat abundance tends to fluctuate across seasons, which makes sense based on rat behavior and the fact that they mostly hunker down during the very cold parts of the year. Uh, but it also indicates that there are some consistent hotspots of rat activity, which may be an area that the city would like to look into in terms of devoting their limited resources to trying to deal with these issues. Okay, so to scale out a little bit, uh, I wanna mention a project real quick by a student of mine, Caitlin Wing, who's a senior in my lab here at University of Richmond. Um, and she's looking at global zoonotic disease risk that rats pose across the world. And I'm just gonna mention this in a couple of quick slides, but the gist here is that um, one thing we noticed is that when we were looking up uh, zoonotic risks from rats uh, in potentially infecting people, it's almost always one rat born pathogen at a time in one location. So rarely is data aggregated, aggregated across space, across places, or across um, pathogenic taxonomic groups. And so what we did is start this meta-analysis where essentially we put these keywords into these scientific literature repositories, and we pull out all the studies that have data that may be relevant for this. And so these numbers are a little bit higher now based on some supplemental searching that we've done but there were something like 900 studies ultimately included in this search. And at this point, I think we have close to 300 data points from people that have, researchers that have gone out and looked at what rats are carrying in different parts of the world. And so you can hear more from Caitlin in the spring when she kind of finishes up her thesis and we finish the data analysis, but here's some preliminary data. If we look globally, the six most common pathogens that rats carry are certainly ones that we should be worried about here in Richmond, even though we have no data uh, here in Richmond yet. So one is Bartonella bacteria, about 20% of individuals are infected across the world with Bartonella, individual rats, I should say. Um, Capillaria hepatica is a roundworm nematode that can infect the gut. Something like 40% of rats around the world are infected with that. And just to uh, lift off the other ones, hepatitis E, a virus, Leishmaniasis, uh, Leishman Leishmania, which causes leishmaniasis, a skin uh, disease is caused by a trypanosome. We see leptospirosis and Toxoplasma gondii. So that's the one a lot of people are worried about because of the effects it has on changing cognitive functioning and, and actual behaviors. So we'll report more back on that in the spring. Another one of my students, Ryan Shikovny, he's also a senior here. And one of my former students, Georgie Silvera, uh, are working on a project looking at this long-standing assumption that there is a link between construction activity and rat activity. Um, and so the idea is that, and it makes intuitive sense that when you're doing construction, you're disturbing the ground. And so that sort of causes rats to flee their burrows and be uh, more frequent above ground and more visible and in more contact with people. However, there's actual zero scientific data to support this. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're doing it in Somerville, Massachusetts, because Georgie, after she left my lab, took a position there as the environmental health coordinator. So she was able to find out about pending construction and demolition projects uh, so that we could get cameras up before they started during the project and lead them up afterwards. And so that's led to about 60,000 images for poor Ryan and a few others in our lab to, to go through. Um, and uh, results on that are to be determined. He literally finished that up two weeks ago. And so we're starting data analysis now. 
And I'll mention that Ryan is also super famous because he's rocking these uh, pink uh, Chuck Taylors and the Rat Sox in a recent magazine article that was written about our work here. So A plus for style. You may be the only one in the lab to have it or have a sense of it. And this was a video. So um, as part of a Richmond Times Dispatch article that came out a few weeks ago, a lot of people got in contact with me to let me know about rat issues that they were having in their part of the city. And so Robert Kendall, um, who uh, works in part of Shaco Bottom, has been super helpful in letting me know about a couple areas around Shaco Bottom that, that I have rodent infestations. And he's also collected some of these trail camera images and then most importantly, videos. And so I'm going to show a quick bit of video here of these two rats. And one rat is leery of this new trap that I put out in the environment. And the other rat is quite happy to go in on the very first night it was set because he gets a free meal with peanut butter and bacon grease and bird seed. So I'm gonna show this video here. You can see this younger individual is inside the cage and the older individual, you can tell because of the size difference, it's outside the cage and the other one leaves. So those are the sorts of images that Ryan's been going through, still image versions of that. Okay, now for the Richmond projects in the next five or six minutes. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is an interesting collaborative project comparing wild, the ones that I focus on, uh, rats with lab rats that Kelly Lambert focuses on. So if you guys tune in to lunch break seminars every week, I think Dr. Lambert was on um, a few months ago or maybe a year ago talking about her driving rats. It's gotten a lot of attention uh, being able to teach rats to, to do something as complicated as driving a small little vehicle. So Kelly is here on the bottom right. JC Jacob is her postdoc. She's also working on this project here in the middle. And Krista Stanger is in the biology department here at University of Richmond. And she's um, working on some of the immune functioning that we see between, or differences between that in the wild versus lab rats. And the reason this is important is because lab rats have been used as a model for biomedical applications, both psychological, but also pharmaceuticals for almost hundred years. And ostensibly they're the same species, Rattus norvegicus, but lab rats are highly inbred They've been an independent lineage for about 100 years now, and their environment, which you see here, is completely different than the wild rats environment. So we had hypothesis, hypotheses about what that might mean for brain development, for immune function, for stress levels. And so what we saw in the literature is that next to nothing had been done to directly compare lab rats to wild rats. So we said, hey, let's give it a go. And so what we have found in the preliminary data is that the traits are dramatically different between wild and size matched lab rats because we're trying to compare apples to apples. So we want rats of roughly the same age and, and uh, maturity level. So I'll show you a few pieces of preliminary data, but when we look at corticosteroid, which is a hormone associated with stress, note here on the y-axis, this is a log scale. So wild rats have stress hormone levels that are two orders of magnitude higher than lab rats. So presumably a much more stressful environment when you're having to deal with potential predators, when you're having to deal with people putting things in your environment, when having to deal with other rats to fight with because it's a very competitive situation. When we look at spleen weight, spleen is one of these organs that is um, where a lot of immune function originates. We can see that the spleen weight is about four times greater for wild rats than lab rats. And that makes sense if you're carrying a lot more pathogenic bacteria and viruses and other organisms. And if we look at cerebellum weight, obviously uh, Kelly Lambert's lab is most interested in the brain parts of this picture. When we look at cerebellum, which has a lot of play with, uh, or a lot of impact on um, motion and, and guiding your motion through your environment. Wild rat brains are, or the cerebellum part, and it holds true for the entire brain as well, are significantly larger in size than are the lab rats. So again, preliminary data, we have more um, information coming, especially from the immune function in the next few months, but very interesting preliminary results. Okay, so now the project that is taking up most of my time recently, because it's just recently been funded and it's very um, important and interesting, uh, is this zoonotic disease surveillance that we're trying to do here in Richmond. So next to nothing is known about the rats of Richmond, and that certainly includes their zoonotic disease risk to us. There is one study that I found from the late 1970s that looked at 20 rats in Maymont Park, and it looked for one nematode parasite that they harbored. So not anything recently and not a broad taxonomic understanding of what's going on here. So uh, what we're trying to do as part of this project that's funded through the Jeffress Memorial Trust is understand three important things. First, we need to get 
a baseline understanding of rat abundance. So uh, we're trying to assess rat abundance through trapping efforts. And so here on the lower left, what we've done is break the entire Richmond region into um, a grid and randomly assign parts of that grid for sampling. And then on the right-hand photo here, you see me actually pulling a trap from one of our trapping locations in downtown Richmond. So next, once we have the sites that we're gonna sample, we set out traps and we keep track of how many rats we get per trap night that those traps are set. And that gives us an idea of relative abundance and how that might differ depending on where we set these traps. And that will allow us to give these visual estimates, these mapped estimates of where rat risks are highest across the city and region. The next thing that we're doing as part of this project is to test for what pathogens they actually carry. So that requires us to take some of these rat parts after necropsy and bring them into the lab and do the bench work, the molecular bench work. And so essentially what we're doing is um, two things. Uh, all of it's looking at the microbial community within the rats themselves. And so what we do is we extract all the DNA that's present within some of these organs that we're pulling from the animals. And then we do two things. We either try to target specific loci within the genome of the potential pathogenic bacteria or virus and see, okay, is that gene there that we know is only present in that species of virus that is potentially zoonotic? So we do that for all the rats. And then we also are taking another approach Sorry, this up here is a qPCR we were doing yesterday. That's quantitative PCR. And this is how we do it. We target a specific gene and see if it's in the sample based on whether it amplifies when we put it uh, together with primers that are targeting that part of the genome. The next uh, part of this is something called metagenomics. So that's down here in the lower right. And so this is an approach where you take all the DNA that's present in a sample and you sequence all of that DNA at a gene that's highly conserved. And so for us, especially for bacteria, we use the 16S mitochondrial gene. And so we amplify that and then we sequence it using something called a minion system. And then we put that into a repository that the National Institutes of Health keeps. And that repository will tell us all the different pathogenic viruses and bacteria and protozoans that match the sequences that we found in our sample. And if they match, then it means that we have that in the animal that was sampled. So that's the molecular side of this. But ultimately what we want to come to is a disease risk map. I think that's what most people are probably interested in for a project like this. And the idea here is that we're taking a habitat suitability map like I showed you earlier and just trying to do the same thing statistically, but for where the pathogen is present. And that's a very new approach that's only been done in the last three or four years. The first study I'm aware of is the study on anthrax risk in uh, Kazakhstan. And there's been a study since in Nigeria as well. And so Richmond could be the third city where we actually apply this map mapping of disease risk. Okay, so, so far we have 60 rats for our trapping campaign. Our target is about 300. So far about 65% have been males. And of the females that we have caught, 75% have been pregnant. So when we do this project, we're not only collecting data for ourselves, but certainly uh, populations of offspring that are removed like that probably put a significant dent within those populations for the people that are allowing us to sample on their property. But importantly, we need the public's health help with this project. So I'd love to have a little bit of time to talk to folks about any issues that you may have had with rats or, or heard of issues around town, because that is very important for us to be able to do what we want to do. And then we want to hear beyond that about you know, impacts that rats might be having on your property, the community, and also sense of well-being. That might be outside of the purview of that particular funded project, but it's super important to this overall. We mentioned how adding Richmond to this global set of cities where we understand rat ecology and zoonoses is a really important opportunity. I think it's, um, Richmond is an interesting place to do that. Uh, maybe the smallest city that we've applied it to, but it doesn't make it any less important. And we have socioeconomics and environmental injustice uh, issues in Richmond that have been talked about a lot recently that have certainly shaped uh, where humans are distributed across the city of Richmond and also things like the risk of uh, exposure to heat related health issues. Um, here's data from Jeremy, who's at the Science Museum there looking at land surface temperature and how that's associated with uh, the types of um, redlining that was done in the 1930s through, I guess, the 1960s, and also tree canopy cover as well. 
So those same socioeconomics and environmental injustices that shaped variables like that may also be playing a role in the rats and disease story in Richmond as well, as we're seeing in New York. So here's the data from New York, but I just want to highlight this research or this uh, newspaper article. This is from the Richmond Times Dispatch in 1943, which says Richmond's rat case as a symbol. And so there is some value laden conversation or, or verbiage in this of the day, but essentially this is about a case where a African American child died from a rat bite in the segregated hospital at MCV uh, back in 1943. And it actually got a lot of very appropriate negative attention in the press and put a lot of pressure on the government to improve conditions there at what was called St. Philip Hospital. And so what we've seen for other issues related to heat and health risks in the city is probably also playing a role in the risks related to zoonotic disease from rats. Okay, so some take home points from this talk, urban rats are invasive, but they're here to stay. So we should be realistic about that. If we have any hope of limiting their numbers and the disease risk, we have to be proactive in understanding these things and how it fits into the ecology of cities. What drives me nuts is that usually cities, and I'm not um, pointing fingers in any city specifically, but they usually don't get on the ball related to things like leptospirosis and zoonotic rat-borne diseases until there's an outbreak like you see in New York right now. But we need to know these things in advance so we can try to head that off. Environmental injustice or justice, however you wanna frame that, is a thread in the history of urban rats. And please, please, please get in touch if you have any relevant rat info, we would love to hear from you. So just a quick acknowledgement of students and collaborators and funding. This work does not happen with one person. So lots of important people working on these topics. And thank you for your attention. And there's where you can find my contact information if you want to get in touch and talk about anything going on in your local micro environment. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Richardson. Unfortunately, we do not have time for questions because uh, we are out of time. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan Richardson for joining us today and helping to discover more about our world. Please join us next week on Wednesday, November 17th at noon for AI in Your World presented by Keisha Tennessee. She's with the Virginia Department of Education. She's a computer science coordinator. Uh, so you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you.